So recently, I took a trip to the Caribbean with the Humboldt Seed Company and Dr. Michelle to kick off what they are calling the Global Phenol Hunt. And we must get this herb to go to the cannabis board. But this wasn't just any old Fino hunt, and most certainly wasn't just any island in the Caribbean. This was Antigua and Barbuda. The first country in the Caribbean to legalize the use of marijuana for religious purposes. We have the sacramental component in the country that needs to be a part of this whole puzzle. Greetings, greetings. Good morning, oh, man. How are you? Yeah, man. Marshall Emmanuel, you know? And it's been over a year since Dr. Michelle Emanuel from the University of the West Indies in Jamaica had teamed up with Humboldt Seed Co. and been focused on helping the Rastas of Antigua and Barbuda grow better cannabis. Disease resistance this is, is looking yeah, super yeah, on yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, right. This is, this is, I would give it a, I would give it a 10 out of 10 yeah. for disease resistance for, for here for sure. Not just any cultivar that was hyped on Instagram. But yeah. And give them something successful that works. <laughs> exactly. So not everybody's trying to grow the exactly. same thing that you know is on Instagram or whatever that they're gonna grow once and be bummed about that we can actually like give them a good experience yeah. right out the yeah. gate. Yeah. Respect, respect. You have big space far away from community where you can't really do your thing but something that was from these historic islands and for these historic islands excited to announce that we're taking the funeral hunt global We've been, you know, hunting in California, in Oklahoma, Michigan, Florida for the past few years. And this year we're really excited to, to kind of take, to branch out overseas. So, you know, right now we're in Antigua. Uh, we had an amazing pheno hunt lined up here to go check out some Rastafarian Sacramento grows where we've been developing uh, a genetic specifically for the growing conditions of the Caribbean, try to help with uh, the sustainability aspect of growing here and just simplifying the, the need uh, of the genetics to thrive in an environment like this. The Caribbean queen. This is the Caribbean queen here? Yeah, the whole field. The whole field, bro. Yes. It looks pretty uniform, you know, all the genetics seem to be homozygous, you know, and the expression, the, like density, the frost appeal is there. Looks great too, you yeah, know? Bro. Yeah. It's like we're not like kind of trying to like superimpose genetics that we're like we do well in California. So we're like, oh, you guys should grow, you know, blueberry muffin or, you know, all gas OG, which I mean is great and people should, should definitely grow it. But, you know, actually coming to a space, trying to learn about the constraints of a space and a situation and then bring the proper genetics that would apply best that we think would actually thrive in this place so like not kind of superimposing our beliefs or our ideals on it but actually just listening to the plant and listening to the people that are working with the plant and just trying to do the best we can and i think it, i think it really shines in this field which is like super low-key up in the bushes of antigua so here's the story of bringing ancient genetics back home and pheno hunting for a better future in Antigua and Barbuda. It's like a call to like bring everybody together. The smoke, the flavor is nice, you know? So here's how it went down. Got a call from Ben when he was in Bimini. Not sure if he was vacationing or researching the Bimini Road. Bimini Road. Mm. The Bimini Road. It's not even very deep. It's only, it's only about 20 minutes. Morning, buddy. Sorry for calling you so early. I know it's like probably like 5 a.m. your time right now. But I just got some photos from Dr. Michelle. I'm gonna forward them to you right now. But it looks like there's a Rasta church down in, on the island of Antigua. It's got about an acre of um, these pure sativa lines that we've been working on going and uh, they invited us to cruise down. Plan was to fly from Colombia where I reside and meet up in Antigua Barbuda. Ben and Jasmine hit the seaplane. Once we landed, Morning guys, um, so we got in super late last night to uh, Antigua Barbuda where we're gonna kick off the 2024 Fino hunt. Kinda had a random happenstance uh, come up with uh, our friend uh, Dr. Michelle Emanuel from the University of the West Indies. And so we took a trip down here. We're gonna be checking out some of this pure sativa line that we've been working on for years. 
being grown by these Rastafarian farmers up in the up in the hills here in Antigua. Beautiful country, super stoked to be here. The people have been amazingly nice and hospitable, and the food, man, the food is amazing. The plan was to meet up with Dr. Michelle and Manuel Dr. and Michelle. get the history of the cannabis in the Caribbean. All right, testing. One, two, three. Right, so a cannabis, ganja, is a culture. So ganja is more than just a plant. It's a culture, it's a way of life. It's an expression of a people. Ganja cannabis wasn't something that was really popularized. Although I always had the notion that ganja cannabis was in the Caribbean before the arrival of the indentured laborers. So I went to Kew Gardens some like years ago and asked to look at the herbarium samples that were actually collected from like Jamaica. And there were two samples that stood out from 1809 and 1822. So emancipation took place in 1845, where post that the indentured laborers came. But we saw a remarkable difference based on the morphological characteristics of the you know, cannabis samples that were there post-emancipation via prior. So prior, the thought is that these plants were pretty much hemp because the Spaniards introduced hemp to the Caribbean region in the 1600s for purpose of fiber to assist with repairing their like sail ships, so on, via those long voyages. However, it was never something that really took root. So it was said the cannabis that the Spaniards brought, the hemp particularly, came from Eastern Europe, particularly Eurasia, you know? But fast forward after the indentured, indentured laborers came, after close examination of these, you know, herbarium samples, we saw the presence of, you know, trichome glands, which definitely support that this plant now the usage has slightly changed based on being a sort of therapeutic, medicinal, psychoactive plant that was used for those you know, purposes, which it pretty much matches what the Asian culture and the Sadhus would have used cannabis for and would have brought it to this region to be able to practice their like cultural freedom. And we can definitely see that infusion based on the names being used but it's important to note that in Asia, cannabis is not really used with a water as a filtration mechanism. That's an African tradition that was documented in Ethiopia some, some like time before, before Christ, right? So it is interesting and sort of shocking to note that the Rastafari communal usage of you know ganja is used by a chillum pipe which pretty much uses water so that also signifies the african retention in terms of using other plant but we also see the names ganja certain things came from asia so uh, that fusion really brought about a unique a ganja culture that pretty much brings about the Caribbean region as a sort of indicator species for like ganja cannabis culture. Before we made the trip to find the fields of the Land Race Preservation Cross, we had to see if we could find some local herb to see what it was like. What the locals call Wadadli. So I think we found our first local Wadadli here. Ben is talking to him. Is this local? Local, local. Local, local. And no seeds. Oh. <laughs> Which, interestingly enough, is the word they use for their island. So every time they're smoking a little bit of a deadly, they're smoking a little bit of the island. Script here, just anybody can have a little bit of herb. It's 14 grams. 14 grams. Yeah, you can walk with 14 grams on you. And what um, happens if you get stopped with 14 grams? They don't touch you. It's Nothing. Legal. The 14 grams is basically man. legal for person. <laughs> yeah. right? okay. Each person can have 14. <laughs> as long as you don't smoke it in public, then they don't. Yeah. Some police, is, some cops are wild. What just went down there, bro? 
Dude, so we just scored a little a little piece of wadadi, the locals call it, a little piece of herb. Um, first first place we went, you know, walked down to the beach, a couple of guys just kicking it, you know, they're already drinking a couple of beers and they had a little local grown. Found a couple of seeds in it, we definitely, you know, stashed them away. They were stoked about it, that they were stoked on the whole the whole situation. They were happy to talk about it and share their kind of take take on what was going on around here in the cannabis scene but yeah first smoke of the day first the first toke here in antigua there it is dude it's definitely a little brown but it's it's got a little terps left to it you know a little bit of like terpinoline kind of vibes to it like it's not the freshest but it's definitely it's caribbean style for sure good. did you expect it to for us to find the doobies that quick that was really fast right <laughs> <laughs> It was time to make the journey and find the prophet Rohan in the fields of Caribbean Queen. How you doing, brother? Okay, here, I'm gonna throw it into your shirt here, bro. Uh, you know that big open land that veggie newly push off on me? I'm reason. I'm traveling around, traveling around, traveling around, so till when he meet me, he's just like this man, my reason and thing on me, you know? Rohan was from the Rastafari mansion of Bobo Ashanti also known as Bobo Shanti and the Ethiopian African Black International Congress, EABIC. Yo, Rohan, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Yeah, we say give thanks again, you know. We have a give thanks for each and every one of us. So whether, whether a person, a Rastaman, or is an ordinary person still, marijuana have a lot of influence and people still but as to my personal feeling to my personal feeling it make you have a lot of compassion you know it make me have a lot of compassion towards humanity and even you know the earth itself you know it make me have a lot of compassion because at times you know at times you know you would want to use the herb to get economical benefits still but most time, even when you get money or anything at all, it might bring a little, you know, fuss between young people or even between yourself. But the herb always, the always have the herb <coughs> to relax you, you know, give you certain meditation, you see, certain inspiration. Where to die even EABIC, still DTO of Africa, Black International Congress, you know, through Divine Church of Salvation. We get the strength from even the church still, you know sacramental rights where we could uh, grow medicinal cannabis without even you know too much interference you know so what's your name here's our you know first stop for the 2024 uh, global pheno hunt and we're here in wadadli uh, aka antigua uh, barbado barbuda 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 <laughs> so yeah we're here in antigua and barbuda um, we're, be we're touring this beautiful Sacramento farm um, with, our, with our friend, Prophet Rohan, who's been the heart and soul of this place, cultivating these beautiful pure sativa plants. Um, our dear doctor, uh, Michelle Emanuel from the University of the West Indies, uh, who's been overseeing kind of our Humboldt Sea Company's gen you know, genetic push into the Caribbean. And we're here with the CEO of the Cannabis Authority, um, and then of course, Jasmine from Humboldt Sea Company out, came all the way out here with us to, to check out these plants. So we've grown some of these in Northern California um, years ago and we brought them down to the university where Michelle did a little magic with them. And now we're standing in a field of almost around a thousand plants and we're seeing some really cool phenotypes. We're gonna go through and do an actual rating right now and try to find a unicorn. Um, yeah, it smells incredible out here, and it's such an honor to be here. You're Rocking seeing how right there's a little bit more variation over here compared to on the other side. A lot side. of them have like, you know, heat. One that cool. speaks to them, and then Sweet. talk about why you like that one so much. Okay. If you, I know they're like babies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta like... I have one right there. Oh, she? which one? Yeah, this yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's yeah, the one? one yeah. yeah, that's it. She's my favorite. Oh, this one, go, yeah. You, let's yeah, go yeah, check yeah, her yeah. out, man. Let's go. Let's yeah. check out this one. Why she keeping her leaves them, she look real, you know, skunky, you know, I do as a sativa, she look real nice. Yeah. I mean, she's yeah. super stacked out. Yeah, sure. Like as far, just as far as like the bud structure, 
Like she's just dense, dense, dense. No room for yeah, no room for more. Yeah, that's a yeah. unicorn right there. Yeah, you know? These are weeds. Yeah, for yeah. Sure, like a you stick. Know? And she's frosty. Yeah, she's super frosty. Real nice. Really no, so nice. like what like what kind what would you rate her as um, for vigor when you compared to everything else that we're seeing here? One scale one through ten. Vigor I'd give it like about an eight. Eight for vigor? And then what about for yield? Yield? Yeah, mm -hmm. ten. Yeah. We're, we're gonna get she's the unicorn, okay. Yeah. yeah, based on the way the buds full up that plant there. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Yield. And what about smell? You wanna give her a sniff? You wanna I'm curious to hear what you think about smelling it. <laughs> no, I'm talking to you, bro. No. <laughs> yeah, man. What does she smell like to you? Yeah, what does she smell like? Describe that. Oh, she smell fruity. Fruity? What kind of fruit? That was spicy kind of aroma still. Mm. Mm -hmm. Smelling some caryophyllin in there. Yeah, there's a little Definitely. bit of spice yeah. right in the yeah. front, yeah. which is yeah. really, really nice. Like, almost like a a little toasted coconut maybe or like coconut cream kind of vibe from it when they they sort of roast they like coconut you know mm. yeah, yeah you know? exactly yeah. like that like kind of like a yeah. roasted yeah yeah this is the winner this is the, the winner yeah. from the pure the pure sativa line still have to walk you still have to walk on <laughs> yeah <laughs> what is going on. yeah but still this is this is our number one for right now That they call me like, that they call him man Kush, man. Yeah, man, smell that. Banana mango. It's tough, man. Banana mango. It's tough, man. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Nice. And purple. A little split top. And the natural little just split. Peace. We are applying modern breeding techniques to these land race genetics that already perform really well down here. And what that's allowing is traditional farmers without a ton of infrastructure, a ton of capital to be able to now compete in this licensed market where you have, you know, big, you know, big investors coming down, big greenhouses, big smart pots, you know, they're like just big everything. And the local folks can't compete with that. They can't compete with, um, you know, that kind of controlled environment or, you know, that, that's just that much uh, input or that much you know financial upfront financial input and so by preserving these land race genetics and modernizing them um, we've you know creating the ability for the traditional farmer to now compete with you know larger you know outside investment farms We have definitely seen that based on the trichome density, we have seen where are the density in terms of comparison to the original land race where land, land, you know, land race cultivars, the trichome density tends not to be as much dense, but we tend to see a different ratio based on the types of trichome shown. So in terms of land race cultivars, we tend to see a lot more systolic trichomes, those claw ones. But in terms of modernizing and increasing potency, we want to increase the level of, you know, capitate bulbarous trichomes. Yeah, the pure sativa was born out of, you know, my friend from Tobago uh, was backpacking, you know, just cutting through the bush, hiking one day up in the mountains and came across this wild stand of ganja and he, he was he's from the area he knew that no one grew ganja up there anymore and he as far as he could figure it was totally untake it wasn't taken care of there was no water lines it was just you know wild it had gone feral at that point it was probably you know something left over from a grow in the 70s or 80s where people were up in the bush you know doing their thing he went back a couple weeks later because you noticed the seeds weren't really ripe yet he went back a couple weeks later collected some ripe seeds from a you know from the best plants that he saw in this field and it wasn't even a field it was just like on the side of this hill underneath in the jungle like underneath the, can the canopy so real rough real rough looking weed and he brought me back some seeds and a little it was a little salt shaker but it was all full up with rice um, and he's like man you got to grow some of these he's like I don't know what they'll be but man it's just like these things were 
isolated, isolated. Like nobody's probably even seen this kind of weed for forever and no idea what it would have been. I mean, it could be, I mean, it could be something out of, you know, Northern South America. It could be like, you know, Santa Marta Gold, Punta Roja original. It's just like that old world sativa. And so we grew it at our farm. I grew like, I just did something small. I grew like 28 of them, but I get, grew 28 monsters. I was like, these things can get huge and didn't harvest them until, I mean, Christmas. I think it was after Christmas that those things came in and they weren't even close to finished. Went through, found the earlier flower flowering ones that had a, a decent bud and had a good nose. Because a lot of times, a lot of the, um, you, know, you know, Central South American sativas, Caribbean sativas, they really have a very similar nose, a really like high terpinaline dominant, kind of like an old train rack haze. And I really wanted something more like, you know, just like more like Caribbean, vibe, more like tropical fruit. And so we were able to find, I was able to find this one was kind of like a little like rotten mango, pineapple vibe to it. It had decent structure, it had a lot of potential um, to, to be something special. So wound up um, crossing the stupid fruits into it, a little of the Humboldt Dream, which are both, you know, real, very potent, almost, you know, 100% sativa plants. I really wanted to keep, I didn't want to dilute the genetics into like a hybrid. I wanted to keep it very sativa, but I wanted to modernize it to a point where it would be a nice dense bud that was trimmable. That was like something that like the modern palette would really go after. When I brought it down to Michelle, it was like very rough. It was like, I was like, this is gonna be good. This is gonna be something. There's some, there's like some phenos in here that I can tell they're like winners. And he really took it and um, fine tuned it. Just, you know, it had, at his research facility and was able to really like run through phenos, find the ones that really shined down here in the Caribbean and that did, did extra special well and just breed with those and take those further and further down the, the lineage. So I don't know what, stage where what cross number we're at now and I brought it to you it was an F3 and like three more you know. so we're at an F6 and so at an F6 like that's when you really start to see that stability it's like between like F6 and F9 is where you're if done you know properly done with the you know selecting for the same thing each time you're really going to see that genome just really kind of bot start to bottleneck and become really uniform which what we saw in the field yesterday I mean all that stuff could have gone into the same bag it was like it always always testing high always looking looking proper like it was I was really happy to see that you know the good doctor had done such such excellent work so like topping the plant is his kind of limiting it you know like in terms of a clone not naturally grows more you know lateral branches but we always want to get want to get this main cola mm -hmm. it's amazing how much this stuff smells like the stupid fruits it's like smells like stupid fruits mixed with the, the original Trinidad. And it was amazing how much that Trinidad really smelled like the stupid fruits. Like they were very similar, like smelling plants. Like they had, they had very different kind of growing characteristics. The stupid fruits was much more dense and prolific, but um, the Trinidad was just had that structure that we saw yesterday. That was just that like, I mean, they're like razor blade thin leaves on it. Like we were, we were calling them like the little, 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 little mustaches. It seems that this Caribbean queen, AKA pure sativa, the Land Race Preservation Project was actually working its magic here. The buds seemed to be thriving and it was extremely low impact and sustainable. I think seeing the Caribbean queen and being a part of all those queens, um, just being on the, the sunlight of Wadadli, being given Wadadli non-chlorinated water um, and seeing the results, seeing the consistency across every tree, um, I think it, it inspired me. Um, I think it, it will inspire other people to see that I don't need all of that to be in this industry. I don't need all of that to actually compete. So yeah, I'm 100% impressed with the Caribbean Queen. Um, she speaks, she represents us all. The, if you see Caribbean women all over the world or in the Caribbean, they stand up beautifully. They show their lush, they're curvy. Um, and the Caribbean Queen definitely gave us that five star rating. Before, right? Whoa. So, so all the worms eat the leaves. No lights, no greenhouses, no crazy nutrient plant. Just nature and genetics from here for here. I can get the genetics thanks to the collaboration and they can, the genetics will get me the desired result that I want. And I think that's what we need people to understand. That Yes, it's one thing we want to grow a plant, quality, consistency, everything. But what does this plant do for our society? How does it help us? How does it improve the world we live in? 
And I think that's what we're going to be trying to find next. Like how do we raise these plants? We know the skills, we know what's required. We know we don't need all the lights and we can still be competitive. Um, but now that we're competitive, what are we going to do next? And what are we going to try to solve? And all this planted from straight from seed. No lights at all. So the entire growth, growth cycle of these plants has been under 12-12. They're started in little pots, brought out into the field. Super simple irrigation technique, just dripper lines. Fresh, clean water and the volcanic soil from Antigua. Man, it's like, you can't get more natural than this. Yeah, I mean, we got corn growing here. There's melons up on the table. Like, this is permaculture. But how did it compare to what was being grown on the island before? The testing unit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, should we get a little piece of this to test? Oh, 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 yeah. You need more than this? No, no, no. That's the worst. Yeah, yeah. And we were about to find out, thanks to the doctor and his Neospectra. Uh, what did we just hit on the window? 5.5. 5.5% 5. 5. 5. THC on the local Wadadli. So that's the, you know, local land race grown. Herb that's common that we the herb we bought on the beach this morning from the from those really nice guys That was the first the first joint of the day I mean, yeah, it felt light but at the same time it felt really nice like it was like it was definitely like a bud light But it was like still, still like sativa like woke you up loosened you up a little bit Maybe like you know find your words look people in the eye like unlike this this fire OG that I just smoked where I'm like struggling to find my words right now the Emerald fire OG, which was which replicated here, uh, or replicated in Jamaica by uh, Dr. Michelle, hit 24.99, and it was actually at like 12% moisture, so you actually would want to dry that out just a little bit more. Then we got the Wadadli, which we bought on the beach, first first people we met today in Antigua, down by the beach, and offered us some herb. We got a couple of little pieces, little pieces of Wadadli, as they call it locally, um, smoked, smoked the joint first thing this morning. It was nice, it was light, it was smooth, and you know, it did the, did the job. It came back at 5.5 THC. So yeah, no wonder it was so, so light. No wonder it was such a great way to start the day. And then uh, we got a cross that, uh, that Dr. Michelle has been working on of the, the stupid fruits times the, the mango sherbet, yeah, which are two two strains that do really, really well in the tropics. And that one's crushing it. It came out at 23.79% THC. And again, the moisture content was really high on it, has everything in the Caribbean, so that adjustment should be slightly higher. Dude, huge success. Much respect. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I use it for like research, I also use it based on my phenohunting, particularly using breeding, you know, to understand phenotypes based on the phytochemical profile. That like helps you a lot to like really put things to like get her to uh, be able to get that market appeal. Previously, it used to be just based on organoleptic qualities and, and you know, using it, you know, now you can actually get rapid testing by using modern day you know, technology and that, is, and that is very helpful. So it turns out the Humboldt Seed Company genetics do well here, but we had yet to see first-hand lab results from this pure sativa land race preservation, also known as the Caribbean Queen. Cool, oh, and there's scissors up here. I gotta get the scissors and pick the one. The one. Oh man, it's gonna be so hard. There's so many beautiful plants out there. We're gonna do a portrait of the Caribbean Queen. So yeah, we can dry a little bit of the sample out. Probably in the oven, not in the microwave, I don't think. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe watch a YouTube video. I'm sure somebody's been here before. Remember any super photogenic ones you came across? I really like the couple of the ones that are down here. I mean, honestly, just following them where the light is right now, I bet you like we'll just see because like, you know, the sun's going down. The plants in the back are gonna be probably a little less mature, but probably right on that line is gonna be like the nice, the nice zone. So you can tell this stuff gets a little less, little less light on this side of the garden. The plants are shorter, the buds dense, but like it's a little more leafy. Like just the individual buds are a little leafier. And it's like, yeah, once we start to start getting, seeing them all getting calyxed out, there's like, like this one, there's barely any leaf on the, on the cola. A pristine dream. Where are you? Where are you beautiful one? It's fat and it's not damaged a lot. Like there's not very much, like there's a couple of little worms on the outside, but we can pick those off. 
I don't know. Ooh, come check out this thing, dude. Be pretty. Yeah, she's just like frost on frost. Le seeds, yeah, the leaves are thin, but the bud's dense and frosty. Like, I'm, I'm actually curious to look at the trichromes under some magnification. Okay. It's not quite finished, but she's a queen. The Caribbean queen. This definitely smells like banana. Banana mango. Hell yeah. Banana mango. Not that she's not the biggest, but the beautiest. That one kind of did the same bud structure and it's bigger, but the leaves are toasted on it. This one looks like an old school, um, like Jack Herrera or something. The structure on that, or like a dream cleaner, like a green crack maybe. This one's got that like just frosty, weird indoor look. Or this still looks more like an outdoor plant. And just the leaf ratios too. Like there's a lot more leaf on this one. It's throwing down harder, that's for sure. We cut off this plant. Yeah. Most beautiful. Most beautiful, you know? Ever give some fun? Yeah. This looks like it's growing inside. Like this is like like the calyx to leaf ratio. It's all bud. Let's keep it in an air condition, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Respect. Good farmer. Yeah. Respect, guys. Keep it up. You can sell this as indoor, like this, like this plant for sure. Like you're, you're gonna look at it and just soak. Frosty and calyxy. Yeah. Yeah, man. I kept getting really interesting looks from people driving by. They'd wide eyed look at me and be staring, and then they'd smile, and I'm like, oh, why are all these people looking at me, you know? And then I realized that there was this giant cola next to my head that I had forgotten about. We'd pull up to a stoplight, and you know, people passing by, and they'd be like, oh, wow, you know, and they'd smile and giggle. And... After we had our winning bud, it was time to head back and see if we could catalog this first hunt in the Caribbean. Plus, the doctor had collected a dozen other samples from around the island from both indoor and outdoor to take a general survey of the land. Preparing samples for, for the near spectra, phytochemical analysis of a few strains from a local cultivar, you know, from a local grower who grows mostly indoor, but he gave us a few outdoor samples for testing also. Ice cream cake, really purple, tanky flavor, got that, you know, gelato sort of terps, you know, appearance, post-harvest looks, pretty good, you know, quite impressed. You know if they pheno hunt these on island or if they're bringing in clones? I think they pheno hunt them on island. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, it, smells like, it smells like cowie bug, it smells like, you know, what, what's hyping NorCal right now. It's got that smell that everybody likes. Mm, this one's almost got like a little, like butter, like a little butter biscuit or something. Like, I don't know, like some little like, like shortbread, cream gas. 25.34, okay. you know? Which one? Fruit Loops. Fruit Loops. And this was indoor? Yeah. So the indoor. Lilanol first, too. Linol? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's for sure, yeah, most stuff's myrcene dominant, limonene dominant, terpenaline dominant, caryophylline, yeah, linalool is like, usually you see it as like a, uh, it can be like a major secondary one, but there's not a ton of strains that have linalool right on the front. So what are people growing under here? Do you see like HPSs still, or is it LEDs? I mean, LEDs. I imagine LEDs in yeah. the Caribbean would be the only way to do it because of the power consumption. Because power is expensive here, yeah. yeah. Drying the cola out before. <laughs> Definitely the trailer park boys of the feed on it. I mean, we're roasting, we're not roasting it, but um, it's being baked right now on a very, very low heat. It's probably like 100, maybe 20, 130 degrees on the oven, doors open, it's on that upper rack, you know, it's, there's a lot of airflow, there's a fan right above it. So um, probably gonna dry out in like 45 minutes or something. <laughs> but. We're probably destroying all of the terpenes for sure. We're vaping off all the terpenes, but we're, we should get a you know fairly accurate cannabinoid profile from it. Just looking at potency, seeing how she stood up outside. Just curious. We usually see her test at like 20, 21 percent, 22 percent. 
<laughs> We're kind of doing something non non conventional here. No, but Ruben told me there's yeah. a little portable oven that he oh. <laughs> uses. You can just travel in the field, get the wet herb, put it in the oven, and it like for 12 minutes something, take it out, test it, and you get kind of be nice. So he was urging me to get that oven also. Oh, okay. So <laughs> this is the this is the approved SOP right, for dry yeah, herb. Yeah. Thanks, Ruben, for teaching us how to dry our weed properly for for cannabinoid testing because I thought this was kind of crazy when I stuck this in there, but ooh, it's getting close. What do you think? Is she ready? I mean, she's close. Prepare it in. Yeah. Grind out some. Let's she's smelling, she's smelling interesting, that's for sure. Fresh. <laughs> we done good. Yeah, fresh. Right. 20.33. 20.33. Yeah. Okay, we tipped the scale. We just got, just we hurt. We, we, Crested the hurdle <laughs> just a little bit. Over 20%. Roots outdoor. CBG 0. 0.7. 0. 0.7, so it's that CBG would have converted into another 0. 0.7%. Yeah, man. You definitely <laughs> passed the test. That's from, you know, yeah. the proof is in the pudding. Like, you can do well growing herb outdoor simply, simple, simple, you know, sustainable in the Caribbean without lights, without smart pots, without, you know, imported soil and imported nutrients and really just having the right genetics. And you can compete with people that are growing, you know, pretty mo growing modern genetics under in, you know, indoor settings with synthetic nutrients. You're growing herb that's as strong or stronger, you know, with the 25% um, Emerald Fire OG that we saw that was all outdoor like that was that was incredible like this stuff that we're about to smoke right now like that's 25% outdoor weed and just based on the genetics because I mean the setup was small the setup was just chill it was low impact put it in the soil and let it grow yeah it's all she needs it's all she's ever really wanted <laughs> is to be put under the sun and let grow yeah and put back where you know she's mm -hmm. from in the yeah. Caribbean you see all like She's just in her element, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was cool she got to come up to Humboldt and play a little bit and then come back down to where she's from and come hang out with you for a minute. Right. Yeah. We're seeing her here, like kind of let loose. Right. And, and yeah. Yeah, she's thriving she's back home and she's happy. So respect, man. Yeah. Respect, respect too, you know? When we first met, I didn't think we'd be here doing this. True, true. Yeah. And not. Not in Antigua and Barbuda, you know, mm -hmm. for sure, you know. Really cool spot. Yeah, Michelle, thank you so much for bringing us here, dude. Thanks for sending me those pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, of course I have to send you them, man. This is the, the ultimate, like, oh shit. Like, yeah. The ultimate teaser. The next day, we're up nice and early to enjoy a good sunrise. With all the news coming out since the announcement of Antigua and Barbuda's new outlook on cannabis, we believe that we have to provide a space for everyone at the table. We wanted to hear for ourselves, and no one better to talk to than the CEO of the Medicinal Cannabis Authority in Antigua and Barbuda, Mr. Regis Burton. I'm the Chief Executive Officer at the Medicinal Cannabis Authority in Antigua and Barbuda. Medicinal Cannabis Authority has been around since uh, 2018. Uh, Antigua and Barbuda were the first decriminalized portion of cannabis con possession. Um, so in our country, you're allowed to have up to 15 grams of cannabis, every citizen in your possession and in your private space. But with the introduction of medicinal cannabis, we've created the opportunities for um, the business venture where someone could be exploring a license opportunity, but also the fact that we have the sacramental component in the country that needs to be a part of this whole puzzle. It's very new. Um, it's a great opportunity. Uh, it's very small. Um, the island is small. We have a 108 square miles. We have 120,000 people. Um, so we have to find a unique way to introduce cannabis to our country. Antigua and Barbuda, um, we ha always have and currently still do a strong Rastafari influence. So we have a lot of Rasta communities. Um, even with, as a joke, if, if not every household has one Rasta man, um, but we are heavily influenced on the Rasta culture. Uh, we've always had a good relationship and synergies with Jamaica. 
So the introduction of Rastafari coming down to Antigua. So that whole culture is within us. It's not the same with other Caribbean islands. You would see that it's much stronger here. So having that Rasta culture within you naturally comes with the Holy Sacrament. So we've had people who have always been advocating for the use of it for their medicinal, for their spiritual purpose, and for their holistic lifestyle. Being heavily influenced in the Rast by the Rasta community, um, and within our constitution, you have the freedom of religious rights. Um, as a country, uh, we had to accept that um, and offer them the opportunity where they're able to use cannabis in their private space, within their communities for religious purposes. Uh, and we don't limit it only to the consumption via smoke for sacramental use, uh, because we know that culturally and traditionally, they've always been using it for medicinal purposes in their own way, um, for industrial purposes, um, even in some cases for economic purposes too. So as a country, we have accepted that this is a part of a community's lifestyle. And we have to, first and foremost, let it become legal so that they can be comfortably practicing their religion. Um, and then try our very best to assist where these are the individuals who've always been a part of cannabis. As a country, we're trying to explore the opportunities in cannabis. How best do we work together to get advice and to bring them along the journey and for them to also lead us in some of these cases. So as a country, we have accepted that Rastafari is within us. It's within our communities and we're here to contribute and to support the cannabis development. After listening to everything Regis had to say, it seemed that the Caribbean island was a living example of a new approach to cannabis legalization. An amazing individual that definitely has the passion for cannabis um, and you know just the love and understanding for cannabis. Just a really heartwarming experience to see and to be able to talk to him because here in Antigua they're really doing something, you know, very, very different than anything I've seen anywhere else in the world for cannabis regulation. Here they're really putting the plant first and the people that have been the stewards of the plant first. So, you know, the Rastafarian church has been, you know, growing and consuming cannabis in the Caribbean for, you know, almost 100 years now. The island of Antigua and Barbuda are really embracing that culture and really putting that culture first when it comes to policy making they're meeting with the rasta elders they're doing things what seemingly the right way it seems like they're doing things out of passion and out of just actual genuine um, respect and adoration of their community like he said um, you know one in you know, every family has one rasta in it here is a common saying and how they really rep they recognize that rastafarianism is a part of antigua and Barbuda. It is part of them and with the church recognizing the cannabis plant as their sacrament, they feel like it's their duty and responsibility to recognize that and respect that. You know, and then now moving forward with legalization, they're really kind of keeping the plant first. They're putting the Rasta the Rasta men first and the rest of the world could definitely take a, a page or a, you know, a look at, at this to, you know, help craft policy. You know, the first thing that was talked about was just respect for the community. How do we, you know, better the community, better the lives of our people and do it in, a, in an economically responsible and productive way. That's just a, a very, very, very different word than, than what we've heard in other places in the world. So it's very heartwarming to hear and see and get to share some time with him. So excited for what is to come in Antigua. You know, and now with the genetics being here and at home. And yeah, the Caribbean queen, she's, she's shining bright down here in Antigua. And, Barbuda and Jamaica. She's back at home. She's happy. Um, she's doing well. We're just stoked to just to help facilitate that and help facilitate just taking an old old world genetic, modernizing it slightly, and then giving it back to the community and letting them run with it and be empowered by it and it being you know you know a positive aspect to you know creating more jobs within within this culture in this place. I never in my in a million years would have dreamed that, you know, me playing with some genetics seven years ago would have wound up, you know, having such far reaching effects that now, you know, we have policymakers talking about the, so the, the positive benefits that that's brought and how it's allowing communities that don't have tons of infrastructure, or tons of, you know, financial capital to find a place within an industry that has, you know, the world over been kind of marginalizing these types of people. So yeah, much respect and just very, very heartwarming story for me. Make sure to check out the full uncut story on the Humboldt Seed Company's YouTube page. 
And keep your eye out for more hunts this year on the Global Pheno Hunt 2024. The Great California Mega Hunt has become the Great Global Mega Hunt. Um, so yeah, come along, check it out, um, drop us a line, let us know uh, where to go because we're still open. The, the year is young. We definitely didn't think that the, the Pheno Hunt would be starting in February this year. But here we are, we had a great, great opportunity to jump down into the Caribbean. Um, yeah, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be an amazing journey. So yeah, come check it out. So, you know, being a Rasta man, you know, and want to take care of the earth, same way. We give to the earth, same way, and the earth, we see it set upon a vibration. So it's a twining, it's a collaboration, you know, with man uh, and plant. Man connect to the earth, the earth connect to man.